It's Cash Color Campus, high level of conversation on live hiphopdaily.tv. I am your host, Mecca, host of the Cash Color Campus podcast, obviously. And we're back with a new episode of the show. I actually have two special guests in the building. Oh, so my girl Ice, my girl Dashida Dawson's, the Dawson girls been in the building. Yes, yes. we the Dawson girls. Like, if she you couldn't tell by that yes, <laughs> like they was ready for the mix. That was crazy because Ice, you've been here before, but Dashida, have you been in the studio before? Not in the studio. I uh, came through while you were uh, filming. For, oh, color green. Yes. Yeah. And, um, that so, seems like so long ago. It, it really it was. It was. <laughs> it was. Compared to the cannabis industry. You know, yeah. it's really cannabis industry almost grows like dog years. So yeah, it does seem like like 2016 seems like 2006 right now. <laughs> okay. Yes. okay. I mean. But really, we in a new decade. It's 2020, and we're talking about some new stuff, man. Because b- the cannabis industry is moving, and we're not waiting for people no more. No. Nope. You know, Hello. We putting, out the in- we putting out the information. We we we're putting out the work, and we're just not waiting for people to put up pull up a seat for us. No. Okay, and uh, that's the reason we got y'all here today, man. Because there's a book tour happening, yes. and we're gonna speak about the book, how to succeed in the cannabis industry. Um, but before we get into that, love to learn a little bit more about your diverse background and all this, just the family aspect of everything, like how y'all sisters just kind of link up and just kind of empower each other, and more importantly, um, how people of color can get involved in this from an ancillary level on cannabis. Um, but before we get started with all that, can y'all please introduce yourself? Okay. <laughs> Yay. You- okay, I guess I can introduce myself first. I'm Ice Dawson, also known as Cannabis Socialite. And right now I am located in Las Vegas, Nevada. What? I was out in Vegas like three weeks ago. I know. We, we miss you at the MJ BizCon. It was so many people and super packed. It really was. There were so yes. many black people, too. It was the yes. first time I walked into that place and I, didn't, I didn't, wasn't able to say I was the ink spot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. on, the new, on the paper. Like, that was the know. first time I've been there and I didn't see that. So I was blessed with that. But uh, yes. let me introduce y'all. You no, no, no. Um, MJ BizCon was lit. My name is Dashita Dawson and I am the weed head. <laughs> and together we are She Blaze. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, um, but excited to be here. We are two of four Dawson sisters. I work with all my sisters in the industry. I jumped into the industry as a patient. Um, I like to call myself a corporate to cannabis crossover um, and jokingly say I went from Target to THC because I was a senior executive at Target, Victoria's Secret, um, things that you're able to do at Target now. I love walking in there because I know that I've left a legacy, but just being able to get natural hair products, okay. um, having <laughs> a beauty section that's segmented just for African-American and Hispanic women, those are the type of projects I got to work on. And um, basically became a a cannabis entrepreneur um, in 16 after the unexpected passing of our mom. Um, She's actually buried in Atlanta. So Atlanta is like our second home. Uh, Vita, the third sister, lives in Atlanta. But I just couldn't do the regular corporate America thing. I mean, I was at that VP level, should you know, have been happy, making pretty good money. You are the best. <laughs> Had a nice car. Well, y'all, y'all need to know Ice. Ice is literally a mood. Like, yes, like, like y'all need mood. to get to know. Her. She's the Real baby too, so she's like 15 years younger than. Oh, me. I'm the baby <laughs> too, so I can get I get that. So vibe. she I get know, that energy. she know like my first child, and so she know how, what that come up was like. And okay. When we got to a comfy spot, she was comfy too. Yes, I was. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I just couldn't do it anymore. Plus, I was in pain. I, I had my own autoimmune issues, uh, early signs of MS, things that a lot of women of color especially are dealing with um, for at least three years. They didn't know whether it was lupus, whether it's MS. And finally, I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't you know, want a label at all. I kind of need to figure out how I'm going to resolve this. Yeah. Um, and so I moved to Arizona where my aunt, my mom's sister, she was already a medical marijuana patient. And we jumped into the industry right away. I saw from my first dispensary visit that the things that I did at Target and Victoria's Secret, the big brand um, marketing and strategy and P&L management, um, business strategy and development all applied. And yeah, you were right. Like I was like a raisin in a bowl of milk. There were no <laughs> black people at all. Um, and then of course I told my family I was doing this. They thought I was crazy, but Ice didn't. She was the first <laughs> to jump on board. She was like, we're talking about weed. Okay, let's go. <laughs> you <laughs> Um, and from that point on, MJM Strategy, which was our consultant firm, was born. But the weed head was born as well. I yeah. just was tired of the old stereotype. So yeah. I figured if they're going to meet me and I'm the weed head um, and I'm probably the most productive individual most folks know, I'm pretty decorated as far as my career is concerned, then I would change the perspective. Let's talk about pretty decorated. 
it is an understatement. Okay. You know, I was listening to an interview on you today, and I just knew you from the corporate side. I had zero clue that you you almost came this close to being a neurosurgeon. I did, yes. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> I'm kind of like sad the whole Ben Carson thing. Like that was my first book I like got. Yeah, and, and we're excited. not talking about just I hope to be a neurosurgeon. <laughs> like I got to medical school and did this, and yes. then said, "Nah, I'm good." Yeah. <laughs> well, the situation was simple. I really didn't feel like my authentic self coming to to work school every day. I worked in a hospital in Philadelphia. Black and Hispanic folks use the emergency room like it's uh, our That's you know way to do primary things. care. Yeah. They didn't care I had on a short uh, jacket. They saw the black girl that talked regular to them and was able to explain what was happening in lay terms and so I became Dr. D. And I think <laughs> I stayed longer because of that, but I knew early that it wasn't for me. Um, in neuro, the pharmaceutical industry, it, they get you from the minute you step on campus. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And I didn't like that. I thought it was real shady and um, I didn't like being hazed when you know you have somebody's life at, at stake. I'm an AKA, so I've been hazed, right? But uh, wait, I they think, haze you in medical school? Yes, they do. Man, we got we got stuff to do. <laughs> like, legitimately, <laughs> this ain't, this ain't football, this ain't basketball, <laughs> right. and this ain't frat. We got stuff to do. Exactly. I ain't got time for you to be pulling down my drawers and right. stuff in the middle of. Surgery. Well, it, it's not that level of yeah. hazing. It's more the aggressive. Uh, everything's got to be under pressure, even though it's not under pressure. Yeah. I mm -hmm. know my team knows because I feel like I'm the Matt Hazen when it comes to that. Like we're yes. always under pressure, and I got that from probably in medical school where there's always a sense of urgency. But sometimes it's a stupid sense of urgency. Somebody's bravado or um, they just want to try to play you. And I'm, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, originally. And nah, no. <laughs> nah. nah. Yeah. It's just basically nah. So Ice, though, you know, I never got a chance to get your story. How did you find cannabis? And, and what made you want to transition to the business? She's the OG for the family. I am the, <laughs> the OG. The baby's the OG. I am. Um, shout out to Rihanna, because I love her. And she was like, yeah, I'm going to smoke, whatever. And so <laughs> I started smoking in high school and my mom's always been like a lifelong user. Mm. So my mom basically kind of created a safe haven when she found out me and my friends were smoking and like walking around the neighborhood. She was like, no, y'all not gonna smoke and go to jail. Just come here in the garage and you can smoke out here. You know, your friends, they're comfortable. And really like- What was their parents about that? Did they know that was Well, I don't know what their parents okay. knew, but my mom was cool. <laughs> so, you know, that's yeah, all that yeah, matters. We weren't smoking in their car, you know? <laughs> decisions here. <laughs> right. So, you know, my mom was just like, you know, y'all are comfortable to smoke, so y'all aren't out in the street smoking. Mm, and so, basically, I've always been a consumer like that, and I've worked for my sisters quite a bit. Um, they had an entrepreneur company within the natural hair space called Tribe Called Curled, and so I really helped with that, and so i just really been working under my family the whole time, Absolutely. but it definitely my sisters are really aggressive all the time, so it's really interesting. Um, having to move into the cannabis space because when I was working for Tribe, I had a whole bunch of like weed pictures all over my Instagram and they basically were like, you know, working for us, you got to take them down. You got to take those pictures down. And then basically two, three years later, they're like, yeah, we're going to get into this cannabis business. Can you put the pictures And now back I'm up? like, where are your weed pictures? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> back up now? No, there was no Instagram all right? <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yeah. Now the family, the family dynamic is real strong within you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know you mentioned your, your middle, your third sister, and you have another sister as well. Speak about bringing this on as a family, um, as a family bone business, basically, like pulling all your sisters in. And was there any apprehension from them as far as being involved on this side? Oh, definitely. <laughs> I mean, first of all, shout out to okay, we got four of us. So my older sister is Imani Dawson. She's an award-winning writer and producer. She spent time at BET, MTV, Fuse. Um, so yeah, you have been working for a while. The 106 and Park D days, kind of. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and she, Aren't you spoiled? Yeah. I am spoiled. I am, I am like, I'm a princess trying to become a queen right now. You know? It's hard. She's like, you got to be a doe. You older than 25. I'm like, oh, my God. You got to file taxes? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, actually. So, but, but your sister, yeah. Tell yeah, no, Imani, uh, uh, when my mom passed, Imani was already an entrepreneur. She she uh, had been natural since 13. I've been natural.
Natural All My Life. And in uh, 2011, 2012, we, she came up with the concept Tribe Called Curl. You can tell how old we are. Tribe Called Quest obviously was one of her favorite uh, groups. <laughs> and we were one of the first uh, natural hair influencers. We, we worked with Shea Moisture, Dark and Lovely, putting them on the map. And then, you know, it, it started to get to be the point where we needed to do more business strategy. Yeah. We did things like uh, we took a road trip down to Essence oh Festival, stopping <laughs> along the way with Dark and Lovely as our sponsor and, you know, getting us ready. So that was before it became like, that's what everybody does now, right? Like <laughs> everybody's showing their life on Instagram. But um, when my mom passed, Imani felt like she needed to be more secure as opposed to the wild and free kind of entrepreneur. And she took her communication skills and took it to the political uh, realm and she has since kind of blown up there but she basically does all types of media and communication strategy and so when I first decided to be the weed head she was uh, one of the first people <laughs> I spoke to that was like girl you went to Princeton you, you trying to what you doing you know but she was at the same time was already attending Women Grow out in New York herself she was uh, fascinated but she wasn't ready to take that leap and she thought I had the most to lose I mean I was leaving a, a pretty high court position and so she wasn't really a fan but over time I think showcasing what we could do with a small bunch I eventually brought on David who is like family like my brother um, his uh, older sister is one of my best friends and my soror and so us rocking out in Arizona eventually we started to need crisis communication mm -hmm. like I kid you not, that market was real white. And uh, we were very <laughs> successful out the gate, but we come in real colorful and real extra. And they were just like, we don't believe she's from Princeton. Or we don't, you know, I'm like, why? Because I have purple hair. Like it was a lot of things going on. Um, we had a, a, a situation where at some point I was being accused of stealing my own identity. And it was crazy. It was like, yeah. and people were believing it because I'm this black girl. I was say, that sounds who, hella black, too. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a black girl that has an unbelievable, so you have a degree in molecular or biology this is and I'm like, <laughs> right. I do. but she she came in to help us resolve that we uh were able to really i i, I had to go all in with the weed head because i was like y'all don't really know me i'm an aka okay. i was all city basketball player like 96 is when i graduated from high school and that's when the internet kind of started so i looked the same google that right mm -hmm. and so i i felt like i was hiding in the industry still that first year and she made it so that we were not hiding anymore we hit the stage at Essence Fest, we were the first uh, cannabis company to be at NAACP, first at Black Entrepreneur Summit. And bringing her on was very strategic. It was how do we get our message amplified? And if nothing else, what we have done for the last 10 to 15 years is talk to uh, black people primarily, especially women of color, mm -hmm. and and they got behind me. They rallied behind me. They loved the pink and the purple. They loved the logo, the weed head, and the vibe. I mean, we even got our own smell proof bags. Mm -hmm. Like they they loved it, and she was able to get it in front of the right folks. Solid man. Yeah. You know, it's dope to see that family that family dynamic working together in the, in the canvas space because we do often see that, um, especially from some of the. Um, people who've been doing this for a while, especially some of the growers, this is a family thing. They passed it down. So it's dope to see that, you know, a, a people of color are already looking towards that way. Like, let's pull our family together. Yeah. And see how we can work I know out. I needed it. It was a necessity, but now I'm looking back, it's probably um, my best uh, advantage in okay. the industry. You know, um, and, and I know that your mother facing cancer had to be a driving force for you as far as getting motivated, not just to be in this industry from a business perspective, but from a patient perspective. Um, can you speak to us about how important that focus was? I mean, how important, you know, dealing with that situation was when it comes to helping your transition into this space? Well, I mean, I definitely want Ice to talk about being mommy's caregiver. Um, mm -hmm. My mom used cannabis before she got cancer. Like that was <laughs> like just to be real. Like she, when she said that it was friendly, I was an athlete, so I probably was just like, no, say no to drugs. I was, I believe, I believed all of that. I didn't use cannabis until I was or, um, maybe nineteen or twenty, my first time. But um, I almost want to high five you. Like I, I, I did too. I didn't smoke weed my first time, so I was nineteen. It was a basketball recruiting trip, and every single person who comes on this show, they be like, man, six, seven. You know, I know, like, know, like, people was like, early. like, I'm the late one. Yeah, yeah like, and shit. I was so paranoid. I was on the train thinking they was about to arrest me, right? <laughs> but that's all our mindset. And then I didn't do it again until my 20s, and it was during, like, a vacation. I was very straight and narrow, and, I mean, mm -hmm. I, 
my, my career shows it, right? Yeah. And my mom, definitely not. Very loving light, used it both spiritually. It, she called it medicine early. She was an educator herself, uh, a teacher, principal, um, educating parents on being parents. But when she got sick, it became a thing, in my opinion, we were out in Minnesota at Target at the time when she was getting treatment. Minnesota has a medical program, but it didn't at the time. But it was really hard to get it, and I was an executive, and I wasn't trying to risk my career. So that's when I really started to understand ISIS, like, real experience in it, because she was basically the plug to the plug. <laughs> let, me, I, I, let me get on my phone and get somebody. <laughs> right. she, lived, she lived there, too, to yeah. take care of mommy, and we needed cannabis like sugar in the house, right? Yeah. Um, she didn't feel like herself at all unless she had it. Um, um, Minnesota tree is actually really good. Most people don't know that. And uh, I used to get like for 25, I was probably getting like, you know, two to three grams worth of cannabis for 25. So when we were buying for the house, you know, it was zips only really because everybody consumed. Okay, so we got to head to Minnesota. Right <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm it might not be like that. Well, you never know what's coming down from Canada. Hey. You know, not going to say that too much, but... <laughs> Well, so whatever would, it was, it was good. Yeah, so you was a caregiver primarily. Yes, yeah. so um, me and mommy, we were definitely like Thelma and Louise. So we were going everywhere, and my mom needed it um, pretty much every hour on the hour just to even eat or to sleep because, you know, she'll wake up in the night uh, to hold the medicine down after she takes it. So, you know, cancer and the chemotherapy really takes a lot out of people. And so the cannabis has definitely helped mommy boost her up. Uh, I think that I probably saw more change um, after the Mm -hmm. treatment, after chemotherapy. Once she stopped chemo and radiation, she definitely got a little bit more pep in her step and she was able to wean herself off of a lot of the uh, opioids that they had her on during the chemo. Good, good, good. Wow, you had a, wow. Yeah, my mom was pretty badass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then she was calling it medicine then too. Yeah, like, she yeah. did. She does call right her now. medicine because um, I mean, my nephews would uh, see it my, or not see it, but smell it really because you could smell like the incense. My mom's like, oh, it's just my medicine burning. It's like, okay, <laughs> mom, we burn medicine because we're you know <laughs> like that. Right. right. <laughs> so so um, so here we are. You know, you're ter- you're currently in the industry at this point. You know, you're 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 now getting past some of your issues. You brought your family on. You're I'm now a big force in this. Um, and from the marketing side, I'm pretty sure that you're starting to see some things that I guess um, don't really jive with what you would see at Target or somewhere else. Like this, I feel like, you know, and not, not, to, not to even, I don't feel like I'm, I'm saying something that's out of pocket. The marketing, the branding, the promotion you see in cannabis is almost juvenile. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So, so so that's why we yeah. were successful out the door. I mean, some of the stuff we're doing is just basic. And, you know, just improving the fact that you're, Telling someone the dosage on their packaging and their labeling is basic. What I realized is that my experience in consumer packaged goods made it just very easy to do what I, you know, I use basketball references a lot, sorry, but like I just crossed over. It was, it was very easy to see everything we do there really does apply here. And not enough people respect the plant enough, respect mm-hmm. the industry enough. Then you also got a lot of people faking the funk. Like that was the other thing. People can make that accusation because other folks had done it. You're coming into the industry reinventing yourself. Mm-hmm. I'm just doing the same thing I was doing for Target and Victoria's Secret. Yeah. Yeah, just doing it for cannabis. Doing it I was yeah. doing the weed before. I'm just out. So, so, my, <laughs> so my question was, though, what do you feel like is the biggest difference between creating marketing plans for mainstream businesses versus trying to create them for cannabis companies? To be perfectly honest, at the core, there isn't a difference. At the end of the day, I'm looking at the same things. What's my target consumer? Um, what Making sure it's the highest uh, level as far as product development is concerned. Um, when you do research, I ran the beauty business for Victoria's Secret. A lot of the same processes as far as extraction and oils and processing and beauty is the same thing we're doing in cannabis. It's just not as formalized. And so I think, if nothing else, I'm probably taking a lot from mainstream in terms of creating operating processes and uh, steps that can be repeated over and over again. Because it's nothing worse than getting a batch of anything that has been manufactured beyond the flower. And you got two, you give one to her, give one to me, and she acting or seeing something different than what I'm seeing. That never happens anywhere else. So I took a 
lot of what I've already learned and, and experienced in mainstream and I crossed it over and I started to write a lot about it too almost not shaming folks but in some ways especially the rich white boys that come oh, in and they're I, I'm shaming them yeah, I'm, like, I'm all for shaming people I feel like this if I see one more brand named after another brand as if this branding gonna come to you eventually oh like like Nabisco is coming after y'all hard oh man. yes I mean, no, actually, y'all are naming your whole strains after these brands dude it's like, crazy they, they, you can't do that but they also must not be googling because in 2017 starbucks uh launched a, a civil suit for the dabacino um you a, a girl scout cookies technically on the east or west coast is gsc now because girl scouts was like nah yeah. i mean once money started to be really shown exactly. in the industry they're they're like no before it used to be oh i don't even want to be affiliated with yeah. cannabis so mm-hmm. let's pretend it doesn't exist yeah but now yes that's trademark infringement that's yeah. one of the first things <laughs> yeah, you would I'm not nervous, be able I, to do i'll be seeing some prominent names and i'm like wow you're a you're, matter of fact i wish you don't make money because the more money you make the more they're ready to come for you yep. right so stop bragging about this brand stop bragging about this strain and come up with a different name and packaging please yes before nabisco come and shut y'all all the way the fuck down but it's also that's i mean first of all, I hope they do come, but it's okay. also the, the 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 target, right? Like I still feel like part of the reason why we uh, wanted to do She Blaze and Ice is like we got to do something for the ladies because <laughs> most of the like yes. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Most of the time, it's not for the ladies. You yeah, know, when we're working in the legal markets, um, you know, I, I jokingly say I don't want to dab in a dungeon. I want to dab like a lady because it's like dark and then you can't take pictures. It's like the nasty. nasty. <laughs> no, they don't wipe well with the alcohol pad. You know, they wipe once or twice. You're so it's bougie. Like, no, uh, but, you know, these are high issues. Listen, issues. It is. Okay, let me tell you have you read some of the reviews from different cannabis cafes and stuff? No, I haven't. Actually, but you gotta. I'm pretty sure you have a point. Like the cl- the cleaning processes can't be the best. No, no, they're not. No, <laughs> no. And who wants to pull from dirty right. rig? No. Mm-hmm. I no. think some just regular like we did it in the vape industry. You know, they came up with solutions for people to try the e juice in the store. That uh, you know, basically everyone was still not sharing the same vape tip. You know what I mean? They mm-hmm. had like the plastic silicone tips over it. So I just feel like we could step it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. Because <laughs> I feel like the, the, the money's coming. Like, that's that's the part that I think that people was able to hide behind, mm-hmm. that there really wasn't a whole lot of money, wasn't really a lot of conversation. Some of y'all pay attention to how much more money's coming in here because y'all going to need to start changing names straight up. Absolutely. <laughs> like, straight up. Or man. just don't start with it. Like, if it sounds too familiar. Exactly. Um, there's one that sounds like Bubblicious or whatever. Like, get get like, rid of it. Then there's also some laws that won't let you make it look like a children's brand anyway. In mm-hmm. Canada, like, if it feels anything kitty. It's not going to happen in Oregon. So every market is different, but the more stricter markets, they're going to prevent it from being marketed so directly to kids. So you can elevate, take it a little higher. That's what we did. Yeah, Yeah, we did that for a lot of industries. I think so. Uh, so y'all are very Too familiar many. with Atlanta. I've been down, living in Atlanta myself since 2012. Native of Boston, Massachusetts. I, okay. I love the South. I love the cool. South though. Like my whole family from down here. Like I, I love the South. The South is quickly becoming a new frontier for cannabis industry. Yep. Y- you know, we we watching more states down here that we once thought we're in the Bible Belt, which you're not going to see any too much traction. Um, I was wrong. You know, what I'm saying yeah. between from Florida, Alabama to Georgia, you're seeing more politicians be interested in. Um, bringing cannabis into these states. Um, with South becoming the new frontier of the cannabis industry, like what do you, what do you, what are some of your hopes and your, what are some of your hopes for what you see in the Southern states and what are some of the fears that you feel could happen down here that might not happen in the West Coast or might not happen in the East Coast? Well, my hope is that they look into manufacturing hemp textiles. Mm. Um, we don't see a lot of that. We see a lot of smokable hemp and I think it's cool, but like textile, hemp textiles are going to save the world. And I think once people realize that, it's a lot more money in the cannabis industry. Yeah, you can make these jeans. Yep. Yes. 
Yeah, big, yep. pretty much anything. Battle, plastic, the yeah. couch. That's why it was made illegal. A lot of people think, and they focused on marijuana, but it was a cover up. It's a business cover up. Paper and plastic was like, yo, hemp is about to put us out of business. Uh, they they knew, Angslinger knew, and the government knew that hemp and marijuana were part of the same scientific family, and they decided to demonize marijuana. It also was a great byproduct, created black and Hispanic uh, work, low low to no cost workforce in um, the incarceration. It is crazy what we've learned just by how the cannabis industry is, but the, what I am excited about with the South is that people know it's medicine, and I think that's the part you cannot deny. I got into the industry because it's medicine. My mother was calling it medicine, um, and so that's what surprised me. Down here, when you have the Bible Belt, you got people 55 and older, but those are the same folks who have arthritis, mm -hmm. um, various inflammatory diseases and ailments, and CB, just basic CBD uh, tincture or treatment can help them. And so that's the door opening. That's the hack in. It's not method man and red man, right? Mm -hmm. It's not Cheech and Chong. Well, the hack is that this is actually really good for you. And if you can speak about science and medicine well enough and that people understand and they believe you, then you're going to get a foot in the door. And I think, and that's why I, I'm just so excited about being in industry because it feels like my calling. Um, I'm I'm a girl from the hood that made good. So coming back to the hood is very easy for me and being able to speak about, hey, this is actually health justice. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are sick and we're using opioids or we're using things that are actually deteriorating our body faster and this can make us better. And because I have my own testimony with my autoimmune issues, I mean, while I was working for Target, I was waking up like the tin woman every day. I play ball, I feel like I'm 80 years old inside um, if I was without cannabinoid treatment. But last four years, I'm back dancing. Um, I got nails now, so I'm probably not balling much. But mm -hmm. at the end of the no, day, my body feels better. And I think that's really all due to a cannabinoid treatment. That's good, plan. man. You know, and one positive thing I see for the South is we can go back to agriculture. You know, yes. it's, 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 this is a growing this is a growing area. And yep. there's a lot of farm there's a lot of farmers, there's a lot of farmland not being properly used. So when you yep. say something like, let's start getting textiles and let's start getting into that, boy, look, you talk about a, a full industry shift. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Talking about that happening in the South. Black farmers. Black, yeah. We already have land in South Carolina. North Carolina is the right now the mecca of CBD and hemp for black folks. Yeah. We actually own stuff there. We can actually become um, a real integral part of the industry from the beginning, yeah. as opposed to right now, they're just expecting us to be end users. And guess what? Based on the way they're marketing, they don't care yeah. about whether or not we re-educated on the real science. They no. just care about whether you're smoking blunts or not. And mm -hmm. I think it's just perpetuating the same ignorance um but just, just remarket it basically yes. yeah yeah this is making agriculture cannabis is making agriculture sexy again. yes it is all right man agriculture sexy again man talk to, <laughs> talk to us about the book talk to us about how to succeed in the cannabis industry uh, so what's the concept behind that well, I mean, I wanted it to be as self-explanatory in the title as possible. The concept is that I am seeing too many people uh, throughout uh, just all of the markets we've worked in. DMs. Just, yeah, all the DMs. <laughs> they're just taking the wrong approach and the detours. And in some ways, especially uh, people of color, we don't have time for that. So much money has already been dumped into the industry just in the last four years um, and dumped and lost, right? Yes. If people mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, big companies, corporations are already failing. So we're missing a bubble and it's crucial. And so, you know, I am a person who uh, homeschooled my son. Uh, my mother was an educator. And one of the things I would say Princeton did train us on is how to write. And I started writing a lot of uh, just the different strategies folks could take to uh, approach coming into the industry. Everybody I was talking to kept saying the same thing. Oh, you may be a lawyer by day, but you want to take, you know, and get into the industry by, you know, opening your own edibles company. Well, that's great. And you probably can cook and, or you <laughs> might have the best edible, but right. the reality is you can make money much faster if you just cross over your skills. Yes, do what yes, you do yes, in your day-to-day yes. -day in cannabis. And so the book allows for folks to do that because it takes you from the rooter to the tutor, I do did this in corporate America where I am an analyst and I break down the different strategies. Um, I play Super Mario Brothers a lot, so you know you go through <laughs> the different worlds. You want to get to the you know the later worlds quick. This is the cheat codes, right? Mm -hmm. Don't waste time doing the same 
you know, mistakes that some of them we did, other A people are still doing. <laughs> um, you can learn about the industry. And it does start with first learning real science. I give real business strategies. And I'm from Brooklyn, so I always have to give real talk. Man, and, New York people love saying they're from New York, boy. I'm okay. from Brooklyn. Oh, my God. Okay. Love doing that. Yeah. all day. Let me just start off the comment. Like, nobody out the blue sorry from New York. I'm from Brooklyn. Okay. <laughs> Let me just explain that to you first. First. So, so you know how to approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You got a point there because, man, look, it, it, I'm not going to get into New York definite and stuff like that. I dated a girl from Flatbush once. And that was, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm biased. Yeah. So how to succeed in the cannabis industry is basically a cheat code for those who are trying to, like you say, we'll, we'll, we'll populate your DM, we'll populate your emails with questions that are pretty simple probably. Yeah. yeah. You know, how do, I, how do I get in? This is what I do. And how we might... It's an easy conversation for us to say that, you know, well, why don't you just use your skill set? That's not something most people think of, you know? So mm -hmm. that's a mentality that we do got to get people into, um, into thinking that, that what you actually do, even if it's, if you're, if you work in customer service, you at T-Mobile right this second and you're the best customer service person on that floor, you 100% are needed in cannabis. Absolutely. I, yeah, customer service. Yeah. You are 100% needed. You know, so <laughs> at times we don't, so. you don't need to become a chef. You don't need to learn how to grow. You don't need yeah. to worry about having a million dollars in cash right now to open up your spot. You just need to worry about how you can use your skill set in this new business. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I think you make a good point because there are a lot of consumer facing issues in the cannabis industry right now. A lot of people are unhappy. You got to read the reviews of the different dispensaries yes. that you go to and uh, hang out spots for cannabis because their reviews are not good. No, it, <laughs> cannabis is, you know, it's one of them places where you would assume that the people who've been doing it would be the best ones doing this. And that's almost Always never true. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, let somebody else come in and do this business. Simply because you've been smoking nonstop or you could weigh a gram without looking. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't mean <laughs> okay. you understand good customer service. Right. You understand how to, how to explain this product properly. Right. Or that you even know the real science. I, a lot of people have a lot of understanding of bro science and street science. <laughs> Some shit that you basically, y'all on the cypher, you're talking about it. And you know that it's doing something, but you don't really yeah. understand why. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I like to dispel right away. We have um, the chapters go through, like, before you can get into the industry, know what a cannabinoid is. Know okay. what a terpene is. Know that it really doesn't even matter how high your THC level is. That part. It's your whole profile. <laughs> that part. Right. Once it doesn't you, like, necessarily That will blow matter. up the whole entire thing when you realize, like, oh, shoot, it's not about, oh, I got to get 32% THC. Mm -hmm. right? That'd be like, fake, too. Yes, mm -hmm. that'd be fake, too. Um, know how to even tell if it's fake because we got a lot of people who are putting out results, test results that aren't necessarily accurate. Like I said, they're disrespecting the consumer. And <clears throat> I'm a consumer marketing expert, so I think <clears throat> part of it comes from that perspective as I'm approaching the book. But I also realize that you got to please your consumer before you can be a good business. And so learning it from a consumer perspective is always best anyway yeah. when you be want to be a business person or uh, an investor in the industry. Okay. What was the, what was your favorite part of tackling when it came to this book? Like, was there one section where you got and you you got to it and you cracked your knuckles and was like, yeah? I, was I think the this. hemp section took the <laughs> longest, <clears throat> girl. But I'm a molecular biologist, so that um, processing and manufacturing yeah. section, like you think you know extracts, read that chapter people say resin rosin they're mixing up words people oh. say strange strands like there's no strands these are they strange proudly what you know, strand like, is that I, I am a scientist first so i got in on that and i don't even really like i'm not a consumer of extracts and concentrates like that that's all that's the team but of course i made sure that our resident experts were like it made sense right. <laughs> to them but i wanted people to really understand the real science so that if you you are brought into a situation where you can invest, you know what questions to yeah, ask yeah. and you know when you should be leaving a room because everybody at this point I feel like could talk a good game as far as cannabis is concerned but do you really know what you're talking about? Well a lot of it's Googleable and, and, and that's where I be having arguments with people too. sometimes at least in my mind. I, I don't want to I don't feel like going back and forth with you bro. But okay. but so many people I feel like if you realize the, the what you feel like you're giving is knowledge is so Googleable like you need to, like I feel like there's this there's people in this there's people right this second who are this close to phasing themselves out of this industry because your main skill set is telling me something that I can Google. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like like or telling me something that is now in a book. 
I don't need, I can cut you all the way out this mm. at this second. And um, it, gets, it goes back to short-sightedness. You know, after a while, you got to realize that this isn't the wild, wild west no more. This is legitimately coming a business. So either you shape up as a business or phase yourself out and just know that you just got to be underground because that's how far you're going to go. But be, it have to have a come to Jesus meeting with yourself when it comes to this. Absolutely. Well, you see that in the big cannabis corporations happening based out of California right now. A lot of them, if you actually just go on their website, they have they're asking for investors. So if you look deep enough into their website, you can see their past P and L for the last couple of years and how much they're paying their C suite, how mm -hmm. much they're paying people, how many loans do they have, and are they actually making revenue each quarter? Uh, a lot of them aren't and no. they are saying stuff from like the 90s and they're like oh yeah let's let's get Snoop on here and smoke and I'm like Snoop is cool Girl. but you know I don't know if my aunt is listening to Snoop still yeah. right <laughs> and, and that's another question we can get into because cannabis is the one space where unlike a lot of other industries you can't plug in a, a celebrity and just go and I think that, that is a, a huge mistake you're seeing with a lot of these businesses. Aside from investing more in your C-suite executives than you are in your actual business, you are doing this thing where you're just grabbing a Snoop Dogg or you're grabbing the most random human beings. Like, even how Post Malone got the... Mm -hmm. the I'm like the most <laughs> random people. Like, I never thought to myself, like, okay, so Post Malone smoked this. Let me go grab this pack. Okay. Never thought that. Yes. And it's and it's a premium price. Yeah. Right. Okay. Hey, these are, never like, thought cheap that. Packs. Some of the flower be trash. Okay, like, air pack. You know, it just... <laughs> <laughs> it's sad. I mean, honestly, though, I do feel like we are overcome with influencer marketing right now. And yeah. a lot of people just generally, so I don't want to just blame the cannabis industry, but just generally think that you can slap a celebrity on it no. and it's going to sell. Like, flat tummy tea, bye. Like, okay. you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> these are the, the things that, <laughs> that we're, oh, I'm sorry, but I'm being real. Like, yeah. shade at people we know. But you know what you write? You write a couple million followers, next thing you know, yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, you know, where's your engagement? Um, mm. Where's that right now is hyper-segmentation, understanding your market um, and who you're talking to. You can be an influencer if you are speaking to your, uh, your audience, your group, your community with respect. And I do feel like uh, a lot of these big corporations have it very confused about what our cannabis community is. First of all, we're the new faces of cannabis. The Hello. fastest growing legal users are actually women, women of color. And um, mostly for, again, medicinal reasons. It's not, it's not just because we want to get high. Um, that don't hurt. But <laughs> we like getting high. But, you know, it is for, it's for medicinal reasons. So I think you got to speak to us differently. And th let's be honest, if, if this is a medicinal product, just going by my experience at Target, first of all, women uh, basically make 80% of the household decisions anyway, period. And then when it comes to something related to health and wellness, then it goes up to 90 so over time, what we found in medical markets like Arizona, uh, where there's a big medical population, the person going to the dispensary over time is the woman over time. But when it's illegal and it's fear of arrest, uh, potential g guns and uh, criminality, That's we send guys. the men. <laughs> <laughs> but once it's health and wellness, which is what the transition is, is the gr women that are going. And so it got to be different. Yeah. Everything can't be with a black ground, yeah. you know. Everything mm -hmm. can't be over hip hop or over hippie. Like it has to be different. How do you feel about weed leaves on clothes? Because I hate that. I think it's so <laughs> ugly. I oh hate my that gosh! With everything in me. Whenever I it see depends. somebody come up to me with and weed, and they be trying to clothes, give you their, they give you the shirt and they're like, "Rep our shirt." Look, You're like, "Sure, the bed." My, my thing be when you be seeing them come <laughs> full in, they got the ties and the jacket mm. and they got the whole suit. Oh, that's, I'm like, that's, that's one the guy. worst. Yeah, that one guy that you see him in everything, but um, he always wants a hug. And he <laughs> yes, always wants a hug. Always want to always want to be in the front of the like lobbying <laughs> situation. We've got to change the narrative imagine mm -hmm. going to lobby and that's your person your representative yeah I don't know. Yeah, and that's where I go back to where the industry itself is um is growing in dog years. Like what you mm -hmm. thought was acceptable even two years ago is nowhere close to acceptable right now. And you hit the head like, are you gonna be so hippie ish or are you gonna be real hip hop y? Right. Are you gonna be real um, you know what I'm saying? Like what stereotype are you gonna use versus cutting past that part and realizing that um most people in here are consumers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um I consume sneakers, yep. I consume clothing, mm -hmm. I consume technology, I consume all these things, and I consume weed. Why don't y'all sell me all those at once? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, why is it I still have to argue with Puma about sponsoring me when, look, 
I wear these every day. I smoke a shitload of weed and I buy sneakers, bro. And everybody who do this do the same thing. Right. Like, trust me, they you have an audience. Right. And we gotta get to that point too. But again, we're gonna see that as we go. I feel like we're really watching this this industry like speed past people. Yes, it is, and it's losing a lot of companies, and mm -hmm. we're a lot of people aren't going to be able to get in. You know, unfortunately, we were talking about it on our last G Blaze episode. You know, they wanted to stall the Illinois market because they realized there weren't people of color that owned dispensaries mm -hmm. or were cultivating. But it's like, uh, no, you can't stall the market just because you found out about the market when it finally exactly. became adult use and it's been medicinal for you know how many ever years. I think it's a little disrespectful to the people that actually even with a full pot suit you know went to lobby <laughs> right, and <yeah. laughs> get these laws and so I think that's really the problem too like you can't come late to the party and expect the party to stop look right. I'll tell you how to, how to hold up the recreational market 49% tax <laughs> that'll hold it up right now because I'll go right down the street yes <laughs> well that's still happening yeah, still did you happening. see those receipts out of look, Illinois my, my cousin came down two weeks ago for the um for the fight Javante Davis fight and again he he, he got a, he owned a smoke shop in Roxbury so I was like you know I was talking to Shay he said bro I went down to the first smoke spot down there man he said dog I bought <laughs> <laughs> I bought three separate eights <laughs> And it came up to like, and it like it was like something like three hundred dollars or some shit. Yeah, and he goes, goodness. he looks at the tag. He goes, yo, the tax was thirty nine percent on top of everything. Mm -hmm. And I said, bro, I wish I would have went to a plug. And he told me today the prices are this because of what? Oh no, I, I boycott you. I just stop smoking. And tell all my friends. Right. <laughs> okay. you know what I'm right. Just, don't call him. Let's just boycott this, man. Let's yeah. go back to Reggie and finding the seeds in our weed and growing myself. Okay. It's a it's a very like. To me, simple math problem to solve for, but every single municipality, every single legal market tries to get it wrong. They're adding a syntax um, on things like it's alcohol, but let me be real. Alcohol is never really good for you, whereas cannabis is always medicine, whether you're using it from an adult use perspective or you actually have a very specific ailment you're trying to resolve. I need to know where in this country you're getting taxed 32% for some for, for Belvedere. <laughs> unless you're in a club. Unless oh, you're in a yeah, club. You yeah. Exactly. They, it, I mean, you're right. They've even they've gone overboard because they're trying to meet these tax revenues. So in some ways, the last few years we went from focusing on more businesses mm -hmm. to municipalities because what we found is one politicians don't know about cannabis, but they don't know about P and L management either. They don't they they do a budget every year, uh, state to state, but the reality is that they don't know how to balance the budget. And so bringing in someone like myself and our team, where we're able to talk about uh, one real consumer behavior and what we can predict, uh, how do you create an uh, environment that has the appropriate tax structure and business ecosystem that actually makes people want to leave the legacy market. Um, I've stopped calling it the black market. So, you know, um, Melik Dexter was on his show, and he hit me with the legacy market. I almost passed out. I was like, oh, bro, that's the it. That's it. It's, yeah. That's it. We, we got to and we gotta claim it. It's legacy. legacy. Because they want to try to now hyper-criminalize that. They're basically like, want to force you out of it, but why? And the reality is, if I could grow it myself, then you shouldn't even be bothering with me to begin with. Look. It should be like getting okay. your hair done in somebody's kitchen. I honestly look at weed like aloe Vera. Like yes. my, my, my daddy had an aloe vera That's plant back good. in the day, and whenever we get a cut, he just go in the back and cut that. We ain't never bought nothing. You know, <laughs> man, why is it I just can't grow this on my patio and just go about my life, man? Like, why do y'all have to make this so complicated? Right. Well, in some markets, if you are a medicinal patient, you can grow your own. So yeah. you know, you gotta learn your laws in your area. I love DC for that. Cause my first yes. time going to DC, mm -hmm. I remember uh, I forgot yes. bro name, but he walked us through his house and he had in his uh, man cave, he had a whole separate room. And he had he was growing haze on one side and cheese on the other. Wow. Yeah. Danny was with me, and I remember walking out that room like, bro, I don't even know how to live right now. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm so I don't even know how to function right this second. You don't ever leave your house to get weed. No. Right. Well, yeah. you know, honestly, that we had a period of time where our cultivation technician, shout out to David, right. he organic. was making sure we were solid, and that was one, the best cannabis I've ever consumed. Mm -hmm. um, it was so much easier to just live life as opposed to what we currently do now, which is constantly just, you know, having to have right. that decision-making process, which, by the way, it still falls on David. I'm like, text me some options. <laughs> I don't even want to look at the dispensary menus in, in Vegas. Because they really flex a lot. Like, I think that's the biggest 
this issue is like the dispensaries in Vegas, especially they're just flexing on how much THC it is. Sometimes I feel like their terpenes are off uh, and the different percentages. I feel like the flower is always dry. It's oh, always, it's always dry. dry. In Las Vegas? Like, yes, well, I've only, yes. I was only, the only time I had a chance to get some in Las Vegas was um, when we was down there for MJ Biz. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was because I was on a, like a, tw uh, I felt like a 14 hour flight. By the time I landed, I was just ready to hit anything. And that's that's what they're banking on. Oh, they are, and, and, they're, and they're 24 hours. Yes. So they know what they're banking on. Because when I say I walked into a dispensary at 3 a.m. and they had happy hour, yep. I was yes. like, this is, yeah, yeah. okay. But hella taxes, yeah, as well still, as a very still. high price point. Yeah. Talking about sixty-five dollars for eight. And I mean, a lot <clears> of their <throat> uh, labs are actually not testing things accurate. So you know, we hear about it after it's on the shelves, and they just give us a little memo, and they're like, "You might have high yeast in this." You know, uh, <laughs> whichever one pay you attention to in. that. You yeah. know, saying it's in a little email real quick. First of all, that makes me want to give a plug real quick to She Blaze because Ice is the executive producer and the creator of She Blaze. She finds all the dirt, so you definitely want to check us out on Saturdays um, at 11 a.m. Eastern time. It's every Saturday, every week, and we go through different hot topics. We talk about business, but these are the things that honestly, if I didn't have her, I don't even know that I would know. <laughs> You know, to be yeah. perfectly honest. Um, and you should know if your testing facilities are um, coming back and they're not uh, accurate yeah. because they're meant to be the fail safe. So to make sure you're getting it, uh, you know, a good product. The one other thing I would say, because you mentioned it. Black and Hispanic folks especially don't sleep on the value of a medical marijuana card. We like to shy away from it and we're like waiting for adult use because we're thinking that's going to somehow make it a, a better experience for us. There's so many benefits to it being a medical card for yourself. For one, we talked about this on the show, there's HIPAA laws. You're protected by HIPAA. So even if you happen to be in a wax state, no, no offense, Georgia, that's going to uh -huh. still test you. HIPAA is supposed to protect you if you have a medical marijuana card. There's some states that are now, it's illegal to test uh, for uh, marijuana or THC. Well, is, Nevada, is Nevada one of them now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. Um, and that's awesome. We're going to take those steps, but you get coverage. But also what you're finding is in, uh, the medical card gives you reciprocity. Um, we're probably going to see international reciprocity with medical cards sooner rather than later. Thailand just took cannabis off their drug list they're giving it to their hospitals mm -hmm. so having that card also when you get stopped because inevitably we haven't retrained lawmakers we haven't retrained the dogs it still smells the terps still smell when you get stopped at least you have something that's almost like a get out of jail free card yeah. because they don't know what ailment you maybe have but it doesn't matter because you have a card to say you're supposed to have it on yeah you. yeah so, so that's a plus man if all the all the everybody listening to this show if you have the ability to get you a medical card Go get you a medical card. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, yes, it's, it's, it's one of them things. It. It's one of them things like how I tell people with voter cards. Like, people say I'm, I'm not going to vote. Well, you probably have a driver's license. You're using the bus. Like, you know what I'm saying? You right. you got one because you might want to use it one day. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, go ahead and get one. You know, just for the sake of it. And the ATF and the medical marijuana programs don't talk. So if you're just worrying about like. Whether you want a gun or not, you know, they don't really communicate. So just keep that in mind. You talk about another black market. I mean, I don't know. They, they uh, stop oh, well, like anyway. firearms. <laughs> <laughs> well, because no. some states, they won't, you know, technically they say you can't have both. And a lot of people use that as a reason why they wouldn't get you a You know what? And I feel like, you know, get I feel, your gun first. I feel okay. like Texas is going to, Texas is going to be a state when you start talking about recreational, it's going to fight for that all day. Yeah. They fight. They're going to have their weed and their gun. And, we gonna, <laughs> and that's going to happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay. we ain't going to debate that at all. Why should somebody have this book right now? Whew. Well, if you want to learn how to make money in the cannabis industry, <laughs> this is a new decade. You know, this is our, like, depending on how old you are, this is the next dot-com, really. And it hasn't really even evolved as much as dot-com would have evolved back then. I also think if you are really trying to figure out how to cross over, whether you are a um, entrepreneur, whether you want to get a job as an executive or as a professional in the industry, this book will teach you everything you need to know about uh, what is a really big industry. It's a lot more than just growing and selling. And because we come from illegal experiences, that's all we know. And in fact, there are just so many different levels and layers. Uh, the market transforms very quickly, and so this will give you a leg up. The last thing I'll say is is that the tour is called Sharing Success in Cannabis because I think it's something that is meant to be shared. I have not uh, cultivated anything. I have not received a license for 
nada. I basically created a business based on the skills that we all collectively had. And, you know, we go in and we problem solve and we fix things. Um, but we've been able to build a multi-million dollar business doing that. I think people can earn their first 100K by simply doing the book, to be perfectly honest. And that, from the neighborhoods I'm from, is important. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. Um, to support our tour, we launched a 2020 Cannabis Wealth Challenge. Basically, I'm a numbers person, so what I figured out is that if I help a 1,000 entrepreneurs earn that first 100K in the industry, I've just generated $100 million of wealth in the cannabis space. Yes. That's real. Instead of trying to come into the industry, the industry thinking you're going to be a millionaire, think about it as is this your side hustle or an entrepreneurial venture and 100k is very viable it's doable um there's there's money to be had in the industry i agree and i think that what you're doing is amazing um so y'all on tour today this week yep. uh, you'll yes. be in atlanta um let people know where, they, where you'll be at in atlanta so they can stop by come grab a book my wife just hit me about getting a book i will go get one on saturday absolutely <laughs> yes well we're gonna give you a book um, oh, up, No, I'm it's, um, it's Kenna Bistro. So yes. she is a black woman that is in the industry. Swan. Chef, yes, Chef, Chef Swan. Swan. She's also a, a CBD coach. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yes, she's in the industry. In um, a mood. Have you met? Well, you oh, met Swan. Yeah, Swan. She a is a whole too. mood. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, so it's going to be there. It's January 18th from 2 to five and it's gonna be really exciting we have tangy daniels actually doing that she does fireside chat mm -hmm. so they've known each other pretty much the whole time we've been in the industry so it's just really like can of fam catching up and they both can share their experiences because they've been in the industry so long to really like what not to watch out for and what are some highlights in the industry that you know there's white space that people aren't really looking at Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, sisters, for coming through and um, hey. blessing us with y'all's story. Um, I, 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 for those who are in the city in Atlanta, um, make sure that you get down there to the for to the Canna Bistro on Saturday for the tour. Um, follow. Make sure you follow the Weedhead. Make sure you follow Ice. Make sure you follow She Blaze, so you can know where they're going next on the tour. Um, DMV. Oh, yes. DMV. Uh, yes. Yes, we are hitting all the East Coast in the cold. I need to. <laughs> yo, yeah, right. <laughs> But before we fade out of here, man, I got one more question for you. You hoop. D yeah. d is the jumper still good? Like, can you still ball? Actually, it's actually all right. I mean, she making faces yeah, like right? she even, girl, bye. I'll be outside a little bit. Okay. Um, nah, I was a point guard. I would say I was a driving point guard. I take it to the hole every time. Um, and I'm still philosophically like that. But, um, yeah, I probably could do a little game of horse and it ain't, ain't like, <laughs> it ain't bad. I feel, you That's know what, I, I used to ball and I, I, I had a thing where um, my brother, he coaches an AU team. Shout out to Huntsville, um, Huntsville Titans. They have won multiple 13 other AU uh, championships. I must say that before he texts me. That's they have cool. won multiple <laughs> championships. But I used to always live under the shadow of him. He was so great. Like, he grew up, in, matter of fact, if y'all know Dana Barrows, Dana, he taught mm -hmm. Dana how to shoot. So I used to, the most I could do was run really fast and jump really high. I was never as good as him. But boy, the first chance I had to stop playing basketball, I did. You know what I mean? Like, and I told him that. I said the first chance I had to stop, I did. And I just became a writer. But I try to hoop every once in a while now, and I realize how bad my body is. And I feel so bad when I watch Shaq's in them. Like, mm. I don't know how y'all did that professionally that long and your feet don't fall off. Like, okay. cannabis, they need cannabis. Oh. If I'm a hoop, if I'm a dance, I smoke before and after. Just really? FYI. Yes. Get lit, get fit, for Th sure. That sounds like a plan. Because I'm saying it's like my knees was popping like firecrackers. Like, I was really trying to rub it oh down gosh. that court. Like, bro, before I die. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Should I text somebody first? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And let them know where I'm at. <laughs> no, I'm not going to lie. My first game back, um, I didn't, yeah. I didn't, they. <laughs> They try you out on the small court, uh -huh, and then they uh -huh, gotta do. The, uh -huh. And I was like halfway down the court, like how or why did I stop? Exactly, up exactly, for this? exactly. <laughs> why y'all so competitive today? Like, chill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all for coming through today. I appreciate y'all. This is yes. a great episode. Again, yes. make sure y'all check out um, how to succeed in the cannabis industry. Make sure you support them wherever they stop at for their next tour. And thank you, Ice Dawson. Thank yes. you, Dashita Dawson, for coming thank through. You. I appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. And this is Cash Color Campus, a high level of conversation on livehiphopdaily.tv.